My name is Daryl Naidu. I'm a principal researcher at the National Laser Center. And I'll be talking about structuring light to enhance laser-based applications with my collaborator, Dr. Angela Dudley from Wits University. But before we begin, what exactly is structured light? Well, it's really the process of redistributing a beam of optical radiation. But what does that mean? Well, actually, structured light has had a very long history, dating back to 7th century BC, when people used magnifying glasses to focus the sun's radiation to burn wood. How great is that? But fast forward 500 years to about 212 BC, and we find Archimedes that developed this burning glass or this heat ray, and he used this to ignite Roman ships. But we're not so living in that time anymore. Now we're actually structuring light with lasers. So if I think about a laser pointer like the one on the screen, we can see that if I just shine this onto a wall, I would have this beautiful picture, and the picture has this little black center, and that slowly changes if I had a false color. Now what this tells me is that the center of the beam is very intense, while the rest of the beam slowly decreases in intensity as I move away from the center. Given a little bit of a side view, I can then see that this beam, how the intensity actually works. It's a lot like when you had to focus light from the sun. Very intense in the center, and it starts to dissipate as you go out. Now this beam is called a Gaussian beam, and this is typically the beam that we would get out of any commercial laser system. However, this is not always the best beam for the application at hand. Instead, sometimes we want to change that beam shape, change the beam properties to match the application a little bit better, to something a little bit more exotic, like beams with these petals or beams with these, with these rings. Now, lasers themselves have become such an important tool in high-tech environment and with high-tech applications. And beam shaping has been characterized as an enabling technology for the future. But where has beam shaping actually been used? Well, in UV photolithography, in basically making semiconductors, beam shaping has been able to be used with annular beams or flat top beams, and this allows the wafers to be very precisely controlled and very precisely etched, something that a Gaussian beam has sometimes failed to do. If we look at micro-machining, in terms of creating micro-gears, here we would use what is a flat top beam or even an annular beam as well, so that the edges of, or the cogs that you can see in these micro gears are made a lot smoother than what a Gaussian beam can do. If we look at wireless transmission in terms of communication, here we use these very twisted type of beams, which are called orbital angular momentum beams, or simply OAM beams, or vortex beams. Here, you can basically put several of them together, and that will increase the bandwidth of your communication as compared to what standard Gaussian beams can do. If we have to look at imaging systems in the stimulated emission depletion microscopy, or just STED microscopy, these vortex beams or annular beams have really enabled the lateral resolution to be improved. And finally, in manufacturing such as welding, cutting, cladding, and even additive manufacturing or 3D printing. These shaped laser beams help reduce sputter when it comes down to welding. And if I had to go to a flat top beam or an annular beam, I can really control the temperature that gets transferred from the laser beam to the metal. Makes things a little bit like a lot easier. So what myself and Angela would like to show you guys is just to shine a spotlight on South Africa's breakthrough science and innovation in laser beam shaping. So I'd like to ask Angela to come and speak and talk a little bit about beam shaping external to a laser. Hi everyone, as Daryl mentioned, my name's Angela Dudley and I'm from the University of the Witwatersrand, uh, in particular from the Structured Light Lab in the Physics Department. So I'm gonna be talking about how we shape a laser beam external to the laser cavity. So at this point, you probably have the question of how do we take our standard laser beam and shape it into some unique profile? So as Daryl was mentioning, this Gaussian laser profile that we have that looks like this bright spot of light, what is it that we need to physically do to it in the lab to be able to create some unique shape or pattern? And that's what I'll be talking about in the following slides. So the process that we use to implement this is based on a very well-known and long-standing technique known as holography. So how holography works is you have some object, you 
illuminated with some reference beam and then the interference pattern that you obtain by combining the reference beam and the beam from the, that's reflected off of the object, which looks like an interference pattern, we term the hologram. And then by just running the process in reverse and then illuminating the interference pattern or your hologram by the reference beam, you can then reconstruct your object. So the, the know-how on how to do this has been around for a very long time, but it's only recently been possible to implement this digitally. And this has been due to the advancement of liquid crystal technology. So the device that we make use of a lot in our lab is termed a spatial light modulator. And it consists of a tiny liquid crystal display where we program and address our digital hologram. And then by uh, depending on the shade of gray that's present in that hologram, we can then alter the phase of our incident light, which, co which consequently alters the amplitude or intensity profile of our light. So even though these devices are extremely small, so you can see on this slide here, we've got a little scale illustrating that the liquid crystal display is only one centimeter in length. They offer very high resolution and very fast refresh rates. So they have similar resolution to your high definition TVs and similar refresh rates. So what this means is we can do all of this in real time. So we're able to digitally shape our light in real time. So there are other devices that exist for laser beam shaping. So one particular device is what we call a digital micromirror device. And this is based on data projector technology. So it consists of an array of many micro mirrors that you can move. And depending on the angle at which you orientate these micro mirrors, you can then project your light to specific locations. And by being able to project your light to specific locations, you can alter the spatial profile of our light. The advantages of using these devices is they're much cheaper than our spatial light modulators and they are also um, able to work at much higher powers. So with these types of devices, we can work at powers in the watt range. A third device that we also make use of is what we call a bimorph deformable mirror. So this device consists of a very thin membrane that has a coating, a reflected coating put on top. And by addressing an array of circular disks of piezoelectro attenuators and uh, connecting these to electrodes, we're able to adjust and deform the shape of our membrane. And by being able to deform the shape of our membrane and having an incident light beam on this mirror, we can then control and manipulate the shape of our laser beam. So with these devices, one of the big advantages is you're able to water cool these devices. So we can now work at the kilowatt uh, regime with these types of devices. But one of the drawbacks is they don't offer uh, the high resolution that we have with the digital micromirror devices and the spatial light modulators. So as you've seen, we're able with these devices to be able to change the spatial profile of our light, but we're also able to change the time and frequency domain of our light. So if we wanted to get ultra short pulses, and then when we're looking at changing the spatial degrees of freedom, this involves uh, changing the, the intensity profile or the amplitude profile of our light, as well as being able to alter this phase profile, uh, profile of our light. And finally, also the polarization structure of our light. So here you can see there are many ways in which we can alter the spatial degrees of freedom of our optical beam. And by being able to control the, both the phase and the polarization degrees of freedom, we are able to generate what we call vector beams. And we'll touch on these further on in our slides. So these vector beams, they're called vector beams because they have a very vectorial nature in their polarization structure, offer many advantages over our standard laser beams. So as you've seen, we know how to be able to control the spatial profile of our light, but using these devices, we're also able to do other neat little tricks in our lab. So we can do things such as mimic free space propagation on our lab. So if we want to be able to investigate how a beam propagates, usually what we do is we place a camera and a se or a sensor at some point in the optical beam, and then by moving it along the optical beam, we are able to see how the beam propagates. But with the technique that we have, we're able to do this all digitally and simulated in our lab just using static optics. And then by being able to address the hologram with different what we call carrier frequencies, we can project the beam to different um, positions in the image plane. And this is what we call multiplexing. And then finally, we've also shown that by using different wavelengths of light, we're able to, uh, we're also able to 
uh, shape the different profiles of light. So it means that these devices are not wavelength independent. So we're able to shape multiple wavelengths of light by using these beam shaping optics. So apart from just being interested in how we actually create these spatial structures in our optical field, we also want to be able to measure and analyze them. So in doing this, we make use of a term called modal decomposition. And how this is performed is if you have some unknown optical field, which is just denoted by the question mark here on the slide, you can mathematically write this out into and expand it into a series of orthogonal basis functions. And I promise that in this talk, this is the only mathematics that you're going to see. The point here is not to understand it, but just to illustrate that we can take fundamental mathematical concepts and relate them into something measurable and physical in our lab. So since we know how to create these optical structured fields, we can just run our process in reverse. So we would just assign our hologram or our interference pattern as the opposite of what we initially assigned it and then we're able to detect if that mode is present in our field. So by being able to detect on our camera if light is present or not, we can then infer based on the interference pattern that we uh, encoded if the mode is present in our optical field. And by using this modal decomposition technique, we are able to extract all the parameters that are associated with optical fields. So not just in terms of its amplitude, intensity, and phase, we can extract its orbital angular momentum density, its pointing vector. We can also monitor in real time how modes vary when uh, emerging from optical fibers. So this slide just illustrates over here, over the course of the year, the course of the years, the different types of measurement techniques that we're able to develop. So with these structured light beams, there are many advantages to being able to use these very structured light beams. And this just highlights some of the interests that we have at WITS together with the CSRR. So we're interested both in doing um, high bandwidth communication as well as using these structured beams to increase the dimension, dimensionality of quantum communication systems, as well as using it in quantum imaging. And then also using what we call superchiral light to be able to measure and probe chiral molecules in, in metrology, as well as using it in optical in, uh, cutting and drilling in laser additive manufacturing. So just one quick example where we view structured light is actually in optical tweezing and trapping. So this little video over here just shows us manipulating micron-sized particles through a microscope system where we're actually able to move the little particles uh, based on the intensity gradient of the optical field. So now by using structured fields, so our structured light fields, we can do cool little tricks such as impart orbital angular momentum to our particles so we can get little particles to rotate around the Petri dish, which allows us to actually create little micro optical uh, spanners and use them in what we call microfluidics. So we can get these particles to actually move around and get them to rotate and spin in microfluidic channels. Then one of the other uh, approaches that we look at is actually using these structured light beams or these shapes of light to do high bandwidth communication. So previously with communication systems, what people use is the wavelengths, the different colors of light to be able to send signals as well as the polarization states of light. So if you look at just the polarization states of light, you're limited to only two possibilities. You can have spin clockwise or spin anti-clockwise. So if you wanted to send a letter in alphabets, for example, the letter A, what that would mean is you'd have to send a whole series of photons that, uh, depending on in a binary sequence, which would make up that letter because you only represent, you only have two possibilities. But now if we use unique shapes of light, we can just send one single photon to represent that letter. And that's what we actually do. So this example over here is what we've done is we've uh, generated various shapes of light to represent the various colors that make up this 2D image. So this image of the Rubik's cube. And as we scan along the image, we're actually sending a unique shape depending on the color that's represented in that 2D image. And then by using our modal decomposition technique, we monitor at our detection plane which mode or shaped beam we're actually receiving. And by having the sender and receiver approach, we can actually build up and reconstruct the image that's been sent. Now, I'd just like to highlight this is all done in real time. So there's no speeding up of the process here. What you're seeing is actually the real time that's taking place in sending and receiving this 2D image. 
Okay, so some of the other aspects that we're looking at is also using this to increase the fidelity of quantum key distribution systems, as well as looking at ghost imaging. So this is all now in the quantum regime. So here, when you have a quantum entanglement system, you have two photons that are entangled. They have some correlation between them, but they're spatially separated. And by measuring just one of the photons, while the other photon passes through some aperture or some image, you're able to reconstruct the image that the other photon has passed through. So this allows us to do what we call non-destructive testing. So by making measurements on a photon that has not interacted with the sample that we're trying to probe, we, because it's entangled with a photon that is passing through the sample that we're trying to probe, we can actually reconstruct and make measurements of that sample that we're trying to probe. So just in closing, in terms of looking at beam shaping in the, uh, outside of the laser cavity, so externally, I'd just like to highlight we're looking mainly at doing, the, in the classical regime, is for high bandwidth communication systems. So for this, we've been able to publish in some very high impact journals. And then in the quantum regime, we're mainly doing this uh, for high dimensional entanglement for QKD systems, as well as looking at quantum imaging. So doing non-destructive testing with quantum imaging. And at this point, I'd just like to hand over to Dr. Daryl Naudu, who will then go on to talk about in, uh, beam shaping internal to the laser cavity. Thanks very much, Angela. So I'll be speaking a little bit about how to do beam shaping internal to a laser. Well, for a laser, you only need three things, right? You need an optical box, a little resonator, a comprised of two optical mirrors. Not like the mirrors that you will get in your bathrooms, but actually these are very highly specialized mirrors that reflect only a single color or wavelength of light. You'll need an optical gain medium. This is what is used to create those different wavelengths of light. And you'll need a means to excite it. The means to excite it could be electricity, it could be another laser. But all these three things combined give you a laser. However, it can be quite tricky to put these things together, and especially when it comes down to laser beam shaping. But one of the easiest ways of doing beam shaping inside lasers is to use an aperture inside the lasers or just simply an iris. Typically, you would use a circular iris inside a laser and that would give you a nice Gaussian beam. But if you want something that's different, maybe you can use an iris that is non-circular, something that has got a hexagonal pattern or even a snowflake pattern. And actually in doing so and setting up your laser in a really nifty way, you can show that light can be fractal. For those of you that are not really too sure what fractal means, here's a very simple example. Fractals, one can think about, is the infinite mirror approach, right? If I've got two mirrors that face each other, when I look into one direction, I see that this mirror starts to get smaller and smaller and smaller. But if I turn around and look at this direction, the mirror gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And a fractal pattern is exactly that. It's this monitor inside a monitor effect, where you see the same repeating pattern getting smaller and smaller or getting bigger and bigger. If we look at a simulation of our experiment, when we find here, we look at the very center of this pattern on the screen, we find six little dots. But if you take maybe a step back, you can see those little six dots replicate themselves around. That becomes one bigger picture. That replicates itself around. And so therefore, we show that light is fractal. Actually, in our experiment, we find that these fractal patterns only appear at a very specific plane, or what we call the Z at S plane, for instance. And if I had to change the mirrors, or if I had to change the length of my, of my laser, or even change the size of my apertures, I can then really transform this and make these beautiful fractal patterns, snowflake patterns as well. Normally, you would see fractals that exist in nature. Well, here we have shown that light can also be fractal, and it gives us a deeper understanding about what fractal patterns are and exactly how they are formed. But in this specific case, I would have to use a specific aperture and a specific laser setup to give me one shape of light. What if I just wanted multiple shapes of light from one system? How could I do that inside the laser? Well, I could replace one of those mirrors in my optical box or my resonator with a spatial light modulator. What I can do with the spatial light modulator is change the shape digitally on my spatial light modulator. And by doing so, I can then select a plethora of these shapes that will then come out of the laser itself. But both of these lasers that I've shown you now 
both of these systems are quite lossy, which means they're very good for low power applications, not very good for high power applications. If I want to transform and move into something that is lossless, what I can do is then use fixed elements inside my cavity. So in this example of this laser that we developed, we use two optical elements to increase the brightness of the output of our laser. Now, what does brightness mean? It's just simply the ability of a laser beam to propagate very long distances in a very, very narrow band. So it doesn't spread too much. Unlike sunlight that spreads out very, very quickly or incandescent light, laser light can be confined to be quite narrow. And if I increase the brightness, that means I can just allow it to propagate a bit further. So here, we designed and implemented two optical elements and placed them on either side very close to the mirrors or the optical box. And here we choose a Gaussian beam and we ask that Gaussian beam to transform into a flat top beam. So what the flat top beam does, it extracts all the energy and the Gaussian beam comes out of the cavity. So it's got lots of energy, but in a very nice controllable beam. In doing so, what we have shown is that we could increase the brightness by three times on a standard commercial laser system. That's quite a big improvement. And we were being quite modest in, in terms of the parameters that we actually chose for this. One of the biggest problems in the structured light laser community was the selection of these twisted light beams. Like we spoke about them a little bit earlier about the wireless transmission or the, the, the wireless communication. These beams have got quite a twist in their energy. So if I compare it to the standard Gaussian beam, which has got a very planar energy, these beams, OAM beams, or vortex beams, have got this wonderful twist. Actually, you would have seen this a lot. For those of you who eat pasta, you would see this shape in a fusilli pasta. So if you look roughly in the center of the screen, you would see the little piece of pasta that's got three little twists on it. Well, actually, these OAM beams will have three twists, maybe four, maybe five. They can actually, in principle, go up to infinity. And they can be clockwise, or they can also be anti-clockwise. But the problem with creating them inside lasers is that the laser cannot tell the difference between what is spinning clockwise and what is spinning anti-clockwise. And so what it normally does is it just combines these two and gives out these petal patterns. But we found a way to be able to overcome this deficiency and we use a, a device called a Q-plate. So what the Q-plate does is that it transforms a beam of a specific type of polarization state into a specific type of twisted state. So it could be either a left twist or it could be a right twist. And we can change the number of twists with this, with this type of device. So in doing so here, when you look at the poles of the sphere, you get these beautiful beams. One is twisting clockwise, one is twisting anti-clockwise. And as you get to the center of the sphere, we have these beautifully structured polarization beams. And these are what we call vector beams, as you would have heard from, as you would have heard from Angela. Now, the structured polarization, structured twisted beams are very important in manufacturing. They allow the beam to focus a lot tighter. And the reason why we would want to create these specific beams inside a laser and not necessarily outside a laser is because we can improve the purity on how we select them. For these specific beams that have only a single twist, we could get a purity of about 98%, which is different from outside the cavity where the max is about 95%. But what if I wanted to select a beam that, say, had 100 twists because I wanted to increase my bandwidth even further in communication? Well, outside of a laser, if I had to select a beam that had 100 twists in its spiral, then I would only get about 13% efficiency. But inside a laser, we've been able to show with a structured material, a certain type of nanostructured material called a metasurface, that we're able to select these OAM beams with 100 twists with an 88% purity. That's a massive purity rating in terms of being able to do this. As you can see here with these structured materials, they're also polarization dependent. So what that means is that I can have two separate beams of different polarizations and I can then select them. It can either be 100 twists or it can be 10 twists. The GIF that you are seeing on the screen is just a simulation and actually it's the first simulation that one has presented in terms of an optical cavity producing these types of beams moving out. As you can see, the mode starts very, very crazy, and then it starts to settle down into the output that we actually want. In all the cases that I've shown you so far, there's always been something that's been put into the laser. 
But in this specific example, what we have done is that we have exploited the properties of the gain medium, of the laser crystals, a property called birefringence, where there's a different type of property based on the refractive index and the polarization. So what we've done here is we've created these ray wave vector beams. These are quite interesting. These are quite interesting because typically laser beams will bounce back and forth between the two mirrors. But here, actually, they follow a certain trajectory. So if you have to look at this little picture here, we can see that we can change that entire trajectory to bounce between these two mirrors. And actually, we create a new type of vector beam that has four degrees of freedom. So it's not just polarization and the twisting of the light's phase anymore. It's actually the number of rays and the number of spots that can come out. This allows us to now create new quantum type states that we can now investigate and move forward with. This work actually appeared on the cover of the Optica Journal in July of this year. So I would like to talk a little bit about, quickly, the, cap, the gaps in the innovation currently moving forward. So we've demonstrated a lot over the last decade that we've done in South Africa in laser beam shaping. So we just want to develop more tools. That's what needs to be developed. Explore the high power space. It's quite important in terms of the manufacturing aspect of it. We want to be able to test more beams and more parameters to identify can they improve applications better. So what that means for us is that before the twisted beams were, in, were identified, obviously nobody could have tested them. Once they were identified, they have now been tested in so many different applications and are found to improve so many applications. So we want to be able to create new beams at different power levels. We also want to develop more efficient and more compact laser systems. What that allows us to do is to build more efficient machines that can then be used. So where are we moving to in South Africa in beam shaping? Well, specifically at the Novel Lasers Group and the team that I'm part of, we're developing a lot of subsystems. So we're developing lasers, scanners, and machines. Not necessarily machines to sell, but we're developing machines to be able to test concepts, to be able to prove that these things have a big advantage. We are also doing high power beam shaping. Myself and Angela are at WITS. We are collaborating on doing high power beam shaping to tackle the industrial manufacturing world. We are looking at polarization and phase control, specifically in the quantum area. And we are looking at amplified development in terms of enhancing and making lasers much better. We would both like to acknowledge Professor Andrew Forbes, who is now currently at WITS and who used to be at the CSIR. He's really pioneered the laser beam shaping area in the country over the last decade and continues to do so. We would also like to thank a lot of our sponsors and our partners. And with that, we are open for questions.